Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Welcome to GRIT TV. Today, the president lays out his Libya strategy. GRIT TV foreign policy correspondent Phyllis Bennis shares her take. And then spring has sprung and people are thinking about seeds, the pleasure and the politics. Mark Pittman is here to discuss that. All that and more coming up right here on GRIT TV. I've made it clear that I will never hesitate to use our military swiftly, decisively, and unilaterally when necessary to defend our people, our homeland, our allies, and our core interests. That's why we're going after al-Qaeda wherever they seek a foothold. That is why we continue to fight in Afghanistan, even as we have ended our combat mission in Iraq and removed more than 100,000 troops from that country. There will be times, though, when our safety is not directly threatened, but our interests and our values are. And in these circumstances, we know that the United States, as the world's most powerful nation, will often be called upon to help. In such cases, we should not be afraid to act. Well, having heard at least some of the criticism, President Obama took the podium last night finally to explain his policy in Libya. Did he win you over? Did he clarify where the U.S. draws the line and why? Were there declarations there that may come back to haunt this administration or future ones? To talk us through it, we're joined right now by GRIT TV foreign policy correspondent Phyllis Bennis. She's director at the Institute for Policy Studies and the author of Ending the U.S. War in Afghanistan a primer. Um, coming to you, Phyllis, glad to have you on again. Um, we've talked about this a little, but you're listening and watching the president last night. Did he clarify why? Let's just start there. Why U.S. intervention in Libya? The core interest or the interest at stake here? The interest at stake seemed to be the humanitarian interest. This was really what he claimed. And he put it in the context, Laura, of this issue of American exceptionalism. It was rather an astonishing uh, presentation. He's a great communicator, our president, and he was very powerful in saying that some nations may be able to turn a blind eye to atrocities in other countries. The United States of America is different. It was the image of the U.S. as the shining city on a hill. When all others stand by and watch, we are the ones who act. The problem is it's wrong. We turn a blind eye all the time. And worse than that, we actually keep in power and we arm these dictators throughout the Middle East region, where it's really where the, this up, uprising is, is happening right now. We're the ones who keep them in power and provide them with the weapons to go after their own people. So the notion that we should somehow, in the context of Libya, accept this idea that it's purely for humanitarian purposes, when the U.S. has said nothing about the atrocities going on in uh, in, in Yemen, the atrocities going on in Bahrain. And keep in mind, the issue is not just, so why aren't we sending troops to Bahrain? Of course, we should not send troops to Bahrain. But what we should do is stop sending them money and arms and say, you know, that fifth fleet that we've been paying you rent for, we're taking it away. We're going to find someplace else. And in Yemen, the point isn't that we should be sending troops to Yemen. Of course not. But we should not be sending $300 million a year to the Yemeni president and military support so that he can go about the business of suppressing his own uprising. But the president did make the distinction and make the argument very strongly that just because we can't intervene everywhere doesn't mean we shouldn't intervene in some places. You're touching on it. But I want you to address directly what he said, where he made his strongest case, I think. We refuse to wait for the images. Take a look. To brush aside America's responsibility as a leader, and more profoundly, our responsibilities to our fellow human beings under such circumstances, would have been a betrayal of who we are. Some nations may be able to turn a blind eye to atrocities in other countries. The United States of America is different. And as President, I refuse to wait for the images of slaughter and mass graves before taking action. Is that actually in contradiction to anything that you've said? I mean, he could do those other things, but he's still making the case why this action now. 
But I think what's left out here is, number one, it's not at all clear that a massacre was imminent. After all, when the, uh, when, when the French planes, the first planes, attacked the, the tanks outside of Benghazi, the reason they were outside of Benghazi is they had been driven back by the, uh, the resistance forces who had shown themselves able to drive them back. Now, were they still in danger? Yes, there was still danger. But the question is, what kind of, infer of intervention are we talking about? There's an equation implicit in President Obama's speech and in much of the discussion of Libya right now that intervention means military intervention. And what that means is we give up on the ideas of uh, things like negotiations that are so crucial. The UN resolution called for negotiations. It called for an immediate ceasefire. It didn't call on the UN to go in on one side of the civil war and escalate the fighting, which is essentially what's happened. So I think the question is, do we have obligations as human beings and as a country to respond to atrocities? Absolutely. That doesn't mean sending warplanes and bombers. That doesn't mean that. It means that we have to do things to prevent that from happening. When it is happening, we have to figure out with the rest of the world what's the best way to respond and do that, not start from the vantage point that the military response is the only legitimate one. Were you taken as I was by the lack of attention to the question of just whose side the U.S. is intervening on? Like who are the rebels? What are the possible futures of this intervention? I mean, this is really the most that the president said about the people whose side we're on. Take a look. And one of our airmen parachuted to the ground in a country whose leader has so often demonized the United States in a region that has such a difficult history with our country. This American did not find enemies. Instead, he was met by people who embraced him. One young Libyan who came to his aid said, we are your friends. We are so grateful to those men who are protecting the skies. This voice is just one of many in a region where a new generation is refusing to be denied their rights and opportunities any longer. And what was your take on that, Phyllis Bennett? Well, you know, it was an extraordinary thing, Laura. We, we have the president talking about what is real. The, the Libyan opposition asked for a no-fly zone. They didn't ask for this level of military intervention, but they do seem, at least some of them, to be welcoming it. Now, when that pilot's plane was either shot down or fell down, whatever happened to it, it's true the, the pilot and the bomber were welcomed by Libyan civilians on the ground. They came out firing and the rescuers were firing and six Libyan civilians were injured, one of them a little boy who will probably lose his leg. And even his family said, we still are glad. I don't know how long that's going to last. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if those same people who asked for the, uh, for the intervention, when they ask for the intervention to end, will we listen to them? It's appropriate, I think, for us, Laura, and on a civil society level, we're not asking the people in Egypt or in Tunisia or anywhere else, who's in your opposition before we decide to support them? And the same was true for Libya. The difference is now that the U.S. is in there with our military, with our tax dollars, with our credibility on the side of one side of this civil war, it becomes more important. And when we learn, as we did today, that one of the former leaders of, of Libya's uh, um, military in the past, Khalifa Hilter, uh, is now back in Libya after spending 20 years living in northern Virginia for, uh, with an unknown job, but who was once one of the leaders of the anti-Gaddafi organization supported by the CIA back in the 1980s uh, called the Libyan National Salvation Front. He has now emerged as the military leader of the opposition. That's an issue of concern. Yeah. I don't believe they started this uprising. I think it was started on the ground by young Libyans who were seeing what was happening in Egypt and in Tunisia and everywhere else in the region. But the question of what happens when the U.S. intervenes like this becomes a whole different issue. Well, this is playing out against the backdrop of really yet more disturbing photographs being released both in a European paper and now this month in Rolling Stone um, showing uh, different 
intervention, the current day scene in Afghanistan as soldiers there once again pose with detainees, pose with what seem to be dead Afghans, and even set uh, killing uh, to music, a kind of war video game. Any thoughts on all of that as it plays out as we speak and as this debate goes down? It's a horror show. And it's a horror that we have put aside discussion of Afghanistan, even as we take up discussion of this now third U.S.-NATO war in the Middle East and North Africa. We're not talking about Iraq. We're not talking about Afghanistan. But we're seeing what happens when there is this kind of U.S.-NATO invasion, occupation, attack on another country. This is what results. And I'm afraid that we may see more of this. I hope that we don't end up with ground troops in, in, on the ground in, in Libya and see this same kind of, of atrocity, this same kind of horror. But we can't separate the reality that we have the same U.S. military fighting the same kinds of wars in the same parts of the world. The pictures are very disturbing, as is the music video. We'll put a link at our website if people want to check it out. Phyllis Bennis, thanks so much for joining us at the Institute for Policy Studies. We'll stay in touch with you. We'll go out with just a reminder, folks, that if you appreciate the programming you're seeing on Grid TV and want to see it at your local public television station, we're making it free, available to them in a special offer right now. Call them and ask about it. We'd appreciate that. Thanks. Adverse from the genetic engineering lobby claim genetically engineered crops produce higher yields, but this marketing mantra is a complete hoax. It has been shown that crop yields for GE crops are no higher than normal crops, but farmers must buy more expensive patented genetically engineered seeds each year. This forces them to become dependent on corporate giants. But that's not all. Genetic engineering giants also produce pesticides and herbicides. Genetic engineering is not the answer. But what is? It is officially springtime in much of the USA, and more people than ever are at least thinking about planting things. While oil prices are driving up the cost of food, there are plenty of reasons to plant seeds, but which and where? There are politics here, too, and it is no help turning to the administration, which seems to be sending two very contradictory messages about food. We have as our guide, eminent food writer, now New York Times columnist, Mark Bittman. Mark, welcome back. Laura. I feel like calling this segment Eat Grit, but I don't, guess that wouldn't <laughs> be right. Um, first off, it is spring. Can we just start with your reasons to be happy Something and thinking to be about happy. the planting? <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoyed all that until I looked around in my apartment and realized, where would I plant well, anything? That's my, my feeling also. It's so great that more people are gardening, but you know, if you live in Manhattan, it makes it tough. But, um, well, that's something to feel good about, is that more people are gardening. There are more farmers markets than ever before and more opening every year. And more of them are taking food stamps, which is a great thing if you're one of the 45 million Americans who are now dependent on food stamps. So there are sort of a host of good things. You mentioned the administration, and in a way, it's the feminine side of the administration that we can feel good about. That is Michelle Obama, who's not officially in the administration who has to be fighting with her husband all the time about food, or he's just signed off on it, which is what I suspect. Well, explain what you mean, because if you start talking about seeds, there is a huge quagmire you get into around genetically modified food, genetically modified seed, organics, hybrids. I mean, take it away, but I read, you're right, what Michelle is teaching, organic, 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 and then look at some of the recent decisions by the USDA approving genetically modified alfalfa, Roundup Ready seed from Monsanto. There's a lawsuit now trying to stop that going ahead. Well, let's try to, let's try to take this in order. You have, you have some, some at least tacit approval of Michelle Obama's actions by the administration. She's encouraging people not only to exercise, but to eat good food, to grow organic gardens, and so on down the line. Meanwhile, the USDA decisions to, uh, to say that Roundup sorry, Ready, that Roundup ready, ready alfalfa for Roundup alfalfa ready. is okay, which is going to, to cross-pollinate with normal alfalfa. And essentially, it's the beginning of the end of the term organic. This is really bad. And we're also on the verge, we think, of seeing approval of genetically modified salmon, 
which is the closest thing we've come to a Frankenfish so far. And probably the scariest, in my mind, probably the scariest approval of any genetically modified organism. But, um, but it's the death of organic that's really got a lot of people angry. Because once you introduce uh, alfalfa, which pollinates by the wind, you can't really guarantee that any alfalfa does not have genetically modified seed in it. And, and um, alfalfa goes into, of course, alfalfa is a, a, used, a lot of it is used as hay. Hay is used to feed cows. There goes, there goes organic milk. There goes a lot of organic meat. So um, this is really kind of a struggle that's the, maybe the beginning of the end of organic or maybe the beginning of a redefinition of organic. Is it as simple as Monsanto-funded politicians pressuring the USDA and Tom Vilsack? What's behind this? What's the process? Well, I don't, you know, I'd like, I'm going to try to spend some Washington and see um, how this lobbying stuff works, because I don't really know. I don't know that direct payments are necessary. I think that there are people who um, honestly or dishonestly believe that genetically modified engineering, the genetically modified organism, genetic engineering, is the wave of the future, is the way to look for the new green revolution. And I think they're wrong, but that doesn't mean yeah. that they think they're wrong. They may be taking payments, they may have cousins on the board of directors, or maybe any number of things, but that's the way things are I mean, there are, are a lot of people that say the population, the world population is going up by 2 billion uh, by 2050, and we need to feed more people more quickly, more effectively. Well, the argument about that is that you can say, well, we need to produce more food, in which case we need higher production, in which case we need more industrial agriculture. Or there's two other ways of looking at it. You need to help people be more self-sufficient, which the UN and many other people, believable people, say they can do much more readily using what was called until yeah. recently organic agriculture or sustainable agriculture than they ever will with industrial agriculture. But the other thing we can do is take a look at supply instead of demand. Is there enough food? Well, actually, there is. If you look at the calculus between a billion overweight people in the world and a billion hungry people in the world, it's just a question of distribution and supply. It's not really so much a question of we need more it's a question of we need to get food into the hands of mm. the people who need to eat it. There are also people who say we waste 50% of the food we produce, at least in this country, which is a hell of a lot. And we feed 50% of the grain we produce in this country to animals, which that grain alone is enough to feed a billion people. So it doesn't have to be quite that complicated, but it's a matter of political will, and there are moral questions. It always boils down to, doesn't it? You must do this every <laughs> there day. There are a lot of moral questions. It always questions boils about... down to moral questions. Let's... Do you see the rest of the world as your brothers and sisters or not? Let's listen for a moment to this report from Al Jazeera, which speaks to a different aspect of the seed question, and that has to do with seed diversity. You talked already about the threat to organics if uh, GMO alfalfa is spreading with organic grain. Um, when it comes to seed diversity, the whole world has seen a shrinkage of the type, the number of seeds there are, the number of plants there are. Uh, and this is a real threat to farmers around the world. Here's a qu quick clip from Al Jazeera, which tried to address some of this from an Indian point of view. Seed is the most important input in agriculture. And it is the most precious thing to a farmer. They know how to keep seed, what is good seed, what is bad seed. And now they have been robbed, stolen by this MNC. Their seeds are not sustainable. Our seeds, farmer seeds, is sustainable. They have sustained for 10,000 years. They would sustain for million years ahead. And the one who is in control of sea? He is in control of agriculture, control of food, control of economy. They're emphasizing Great the clip. control question. Well, that goes back to GM. I mean, you were talking about diversity, and diversity is a big problem. But, but one factor or one, one force in reducing diversity are genetically engineered seeds. And now you have companies like I mean, Monsanto is the most common name, but there are a dozen of them who are patenting, or patenting, as your first clip said, but I'm not allowed to say that, patenting seeds uh, that they create and not allowing people, you can't breed them, you can't save them from year to year, and we're also uh, reducing the number of seeds that exist. So 
it's really for especially for third world farmers, it's the worst possible situation. The Times, where you write, has been hosting a kind of debate around seed banking, because one of the answers to this is, uh, if it, you know, in addition to challenging the corporate control, trying to preserve the diversity by banking seeds. Um, here's a, just a glimpse of a seed bank up north. Take a look. A tremendous amount of the diversity of some of the most important crops in the world is now really safe. This is a frozen garden of Eden. It is uh, really fantastic, but it's cold. So I'm sure the seeds will be quite happy here. The temperature by the end of the century um, is very likely to exceed the highest temperature ever recorded at any of those places. So when you're talking about two degree change in the next 30 or 40 years, you're talking about something that's actually out of bounds from anything they've experienced up to date in history. Do you think seed banks are over precaution? Oh, not an over precaution at all. I wonder if it's enough of a precaution. Um, you know, cl climate change is definitely at the root of a lot of what's going on. We really have problems here. And um, the fact that in this country, uh, many, many people, especially legislators, don't acknowledge that this is happening is, is really bad for the future. We'll put a link to the full Seed Warrior film on the, show, on the website of the show. I can't let you go without asking you whether you're worried about radioactivity and fallout and food. Apropos of the crisis in Japan, they're measuring radioactivity in rainwater in Massachusetts. Is this going to be a topic um, of a future column? I haven't been worried. Um, it does seem like each passing day it gets a little scarier. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff to be afraid about. I, I guess we'll find out whether this is really one of them. As of today, I'm not worried. With respect to what's happening at the Times, I just asked, have to ask you as you're there, we're getting concerned about the Times. <laughs> Frank Rich leaving, Bob Herbert leaving, the pay wall. You want to share any thoughts about any of this? I'm happy yeah, to see you on the op-ed page. Well, there you go. I mean, life is change, as they used to say. And, um, you know, both Frank and Bob had reasons for leaving. And um, I'm sure they'll go on to great things. I am a huge fan of both of theirs. Uh, there will be new blood. There's me, which I'm happy about. I'm glad you're happy about. Joe Nocera is starting soon, and he's going to be terrific. And as for the paywall, it's not free. I mean, we all cost money. And um, I think the reception to it has been pretty good, and I'm encouraged by that. All right. I'm fine with charging for some media. Really am. Thanks for coming in. It's great to have you, Mark. Great to be here. Media isn't free. There's a protest happening against Monsanto. Millions against Monsanto, the group, are organizing a day of protest October 16th. Long way off, but we're rolling out with a clip from their call to action. Take a look. idea behind the campaign is that we want to make GMO labeling mandated by law. The bottom line is that if we restore consumers' right to know whether their food has been genetically engineered or not, this uh, technology uh, vanishes. And that's what this campaign is about, and we truly believe that if there were labels telling people what they were eating in their food, that less people would buy genetically modified food and more people would buy organic food. strategy approach to this battle to, against Monsanto in the United States. Because the corporations own the federal government, we can't really expect there to be change there.
The latest front in the all-out war on abortion is, again, South Dakota, which succeeded recently in passing a law that forces women seeking abortions to first to get advice at pregnancy help centers, otherwise known as crisis pregnancy centers, which aren't health care centers, but rather places where anti-abortion counselors pressure pregnant women to carry their pregnancies to term. South Dakota has only one center for non-emergency abortion in the state, Planned Parenthood which flies in a doctor from Minnesota every week. The three-day required waiting period in the new law would force women who drive across the state, say, to get an appointment at the clinic to find somewhere to stay or make several trips to cover those three days, as well as be pressured by anti-choice activists. There is a clear downside for poor pregnant women seeking abortions. But for some, there's an upside, too, increased business. Take Leslie Unruh, the anti-choice activist I wrote about in the book Blue Grit. She'll be seeing more clients now that the law effectively forces women through the doors of her Alpha Center. Unruh knows how to keep up traffic at the center. She lobbied extensively for this bill, as well as for prior versions of the same thing. Actually, she's been such an active lobbyist that a complaint was filed that her lobbying violates her tax-exempt status. Clinics like hers fight to cut federal aid to Planned Parenthood, but they receive millions of dollars of federal funds through abstinence-only education. And Obama's been good for Unruh, too. The compromise on health care reform will actually send more money to clinics like Alpha as well. No need to fret about church and state. Amanda Marcotte points out nearly all of these centers also have religious backing. Nice. It is beginning to get clearer just what kind of job creation the right actually approve of. Privatize public services, shrink available health care, but create a big fat bonanza for right-wing lobby groups. We've no idea if there will be cash for housing, food, or schools for the children that will be forced to be born, thanks to laws like South Dakota's. But Unruh's probably not worrying about that too much. She's too busy fighting for life, the life of her alpha center, that is. That's it for today's program. You'll find everything you've seen on our website, grittv.org, and sign up there for our email list so we can stay in touch with you. Don't forget, you can find me or Grit TV on Twitter. And before you go away, don't forget our Facebook page. Have you friended us yet? Come on. You can keep your contributions coming. It's thanks to you. We're broadcasting commercial-free on Free Speech TV, Dish Network Channel 9415, Direct TV 348, and we're on the Bridges Channel. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.